Hi guys, Wet Hair Dane here, and welcome to my October reading wrap-up. So I've just got the first book to start you off with for now. This is The Golden One Reckoning by Hans M. Hershey. This is the third book in his sort of YA fantasy trilogy, and indeed this is quite a new release. He uh, contacted me asking if I wanted to read this, and I said, well, I haven't read the first one, can you just send me the first one? And he ended up sending me all three, and I kind of binged through them. They were pretty good, especially for indie writing, uh, like really nicely, uh, you know, it's published by Beat and Track Publishing, and they did a great job with all the formatting and all that stuff, all the editing, and basically here we're following this, uh, the, the golden one who is a teenage boy called Jason who can turn into a butterfly, uh, and he kind of communicates with mother nature and that sort of thing to stop bad things from happening. It actually has this pretty cool like conservationalist um, message to it, which is very cool. There's also kind of a tragic ending, it almost reminded me of the ending of The Amber Spyglass by Philip Pullman, which is like the ending of my favourite trilogy, uh, but I don't want to spoil what that was. I will be doing a fuller review of this, which I'll link to below as part of Tarden Dane's Indie Read Along. But suffice to say, I did enjoy this. I thought it was probably the best of the trilogy. The stakes felt really high in this one. It kind of went from like small town stakes to um, like this sort of closed community of the Beyonson, who are these the people who can turn into animals. And then by the end of this one, like the whole earth is at stake. And uh, there was this great bit where it's kind of like, yeah, the Golden One saved the planet, but. In our world, we don't have a golden one. We need to do it ourselves, you know? And I think that's quite a healthy message for it to have. So I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. Okay, guys, I've got one more book to update you on, and that is Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. This is kind of both fiction and non-fiction, or at least that's how kind of she uh, describes it in her introduction. It's really worth reading the introduction, actually, because there's an interesting story about how the publisher who originally picked it up, they were eventually acquired by Rupert Murdoch, and so she changed to Vintage, who published this edition. Uh, I'll read you the blurb quickly because it's pretty short. In innovative in style, it's humour by turns, punchy and tender. Oranges are not the only fruit is a few days ride into the bizarre outposts of religious excess and human obsession. It's a love story too. And it's got LGBTQIA themes, it's got religious themes, it's got themes of growing up in working class England. So there are quite a few like different things that I either have first hand experience of or especially in the setting, in the, in the particular setting of working class England. Um, I have kind of experience of that as well, and um, yeah, beautifully written, just fantastic read. I, I, I couldn't not recommend it. I gave it a 4.25 out of 5, and we'll be trying to read some more Jeanette Winterson in the coming months. All right, I got a couple more books for you. So I read The Lie Tree by Francis Hardinge. I'll link below to the review I've done of this. Basically, this is kind of like a mixture of like historical fiction, YA, like a little bit of small town thriller, I guess, mystery, magical realism. And basically it's, it's sort of set in like a Victorian England and it follows this little girl. Well, I say little, she's like a teenage girl, typical YA age, you know? Uh, and her father is uh, a reverend and he's like discovered the bones of like a fallen angel. Only it turns out that that's a lie. And um, the reason that it was a lie is because he's actually discovered something he calls the mendacity tree, which is the lie tree. Uh, it grows in the darkness and if you tell the tree a lie and then you spread that lie throughout people, the more it spreads, like the more the tree grows and it gives you these uh, fruits and when you eat the fruit you then discover a truth basically. And her father dies, she discovers the tree and she starts uh, telling a few, few little porcupines to get some fruit to, to see what's going on. And yeah, it was a very sort of quirky book. Uh, it did a great job of exploring the impact that lies can have, especially on a small community. A lot of stuff about death and how that's represented for, uh, by the Victorians as well. And um, so you see a lot of like the funeral preparations, things like uh, it's suspected that maybe her father committed suicide, in which case his all of his property would go to the crown and he can't be buried on consecrated ground in the church. So there's all this really interesting stuff about how the Victorians view death, which is something that I actually for reasons of my own have interest in. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy this one. I gave it a 4.25 out of five, would recommend, and I will be reading some more Francis Hardinge in the future. Okay, then I read Colorless Sakura Suzaki and His Years of Pilgrimage by Haruki Murakami. This was sent to me by Charles Heathcote, and it was excellent. I mean, I've read maybe like four Murakami books now. This one, basically, it, it is, it's like the years of pilgrimage of this dude, it's like, it almost reminded me of Stoner by John Williams in that respect, and that it kind of follows this guy as he gets a bit older, um, but also, yeah, it, it doesn't like follow his whole life or anything like that, so he, you know, it doesn't end with his, it doesn't like begin with his birth and end in his death, but it does have um, some really cool sort of themes of, 
you know, I've come into terms with things, I guess. So he was part of this group of five friends and the others, the other four all had like colours in their names. And so he was the colourless one, you know. And for some reason, when they were all about 16, they all just cast him out and never explained why. And he just sort of never really got over it, but moved on with his life. And then he's kind of in his 30s and for one reason and another, he decides to kind of go and reconnect with these people and find out what gives. And so... Yeah, we get to kind of delve into that past there, but it's also just really beautifully written and just a, you know, a, a really stunning story in itself. So I gave this, this is another 4.25 out of 5. Hello, it's me, and I have two more books to report on. So the first is Andrew Hodges, Alan Shoring, The Enigma. This is a beast of a non-fiction book. It's basically the definitive biography of Alan Shoring. It's actually what the movie, The Imitation Game, was based on. My edition is like 600 pages long, but in this teeny tiny print, does have some photos and stuff as well um, so yeah bit of a beast but really enjoyable actually I will say a lot of the science and the mathematics kind of went over my head I would say I'm probably above average uh, above the average person in terms of like mathematics and probably with science as well I mean when I was a kid maths used to be my thing I used to be better at maths than English um, and yeah, like maths and computers and computer science. I nearly studied maths and computer science at university. And my brother and sister actually did. So if I had, maybe I would have understood this more. I actually put in my Goodreads review. I think if you were an undergraduate mathematics uh, student, or even if you'd graduated with an undergraduate degree, you're going to struggle with this because it's, it's intense. However, there are also bits that I did understand, uh, particularly with... So Turing basically helped at Bletchley Park with decoding the German Enigma machine, which was being used to transmit wartime messages. Um, and actually, it turns out that basically the machine itself, the, the Germans thought that the machine was uncrackable, so they didn't take these other basic security precautions, and that's what led to human error creeping in. And it was the human error that combined with like the mathematical ability that enabled the Allies to crack it. So basically, if the Germans hadn't been so sure that the Enigma machine was un uncrackable and had just taken basic precautions with it, then it would have been uncrackable. <laughs> but they did do some stuff like adding an extra rotor and all this stuff. And yeah, it was really interesting to see how Turing did all that. Uh, then as well, after the war, he did... Well, before, during and after the war, he did a lot of work on some papers that eventually became like the foundation of modern computing. So that was really why I was interested. Uh, but he was also a gay man at a time when it was illegal to be gay. He was actually uh, persecuted for it, really. Well, he had a lover, and his lover told a friend where Alan Turing lived. The friend broke in, and then Turing reported the break-in to the police. And instead of investigating the break-in, the police arrested him for gross indecency. So, yeah. That's kind of sucky, and then, I don't, you know, it's not really a spoiler, especially when it's a biography of somebody who died in 1957 or whatever, but, yeah, he tragically took his own life as well. And just with a mind like his, just imagine what he would have been capable of, you know? Especially if he was, what, in his 40s, I think? If he'd have lived until he was 80, 90, he would have lived through the, you know, the invention of the Mac and pretty much to the creation of the internet and just imagine what he could have done you know i did still only give this a 3.5 out of 5 though because again it was very dense it was my bedtime book and it took me about three months to read it but i'm glad i finished and then we have the tragedy of the Carrasco by sir arthur conan doyle this is one of his i guess lesser known works because obviously he's most well known for the sherlock holmes books and maybe for the lost world this book basically follows a group of like holiday makers i guess who are, um, they're traveling through Egypt when suddenly they basically get captured by uh, Arabs on camels. Uh, it's pretty, a pretty racist. I mean, it's, it's a product of its times, you know. There's actually nothing too racist, uh, if you can say such a thing. You know, it, it's all fairly harmless. It's not like extremely poor taste or even like racial slurs or anything like that, really. It's just the portrayal of certain ethnicities is pretty cliche even there's a frenchman in this and he's a pretty cliche frenchman you know but yeah it was really interesting and we then get this bit where basically we're traveling across the desert they've been captured and they're trying to figure out how to escape and um they're basically told if you convert to islam and renounce christianity we'll let you live even though i think even then they're just going to be slaves anyway so it's not that good of a deal but uh, yeah, really, really good, really. I would say like 3.75 out of 5 for me. And just, it's Conan Doyle. I eventually want to read everything he's ever written. And this was no exception. And this edition was actually a really nice edition. With a foreword by Tony Robinson, who played Baldrick in Blackadder. But who also did Time Team. So I guess... 
No, I still don't really know what he has to do with the subject matter of the book. Maybe he's a Conan Doyle fan as well. Who knows? But yeah, 3.75 out of 5. Did enjoy. Hi guys, just one more to update you on here. This is Seriously Just Go To Sleep by Adam Mansbach and Ricardo Cortez. This is basically the children's version of the book Go The Fuck To Sleep, which is a children's book for adults. So you could actually read this to your children. I'll read you a couple of pages to give you a feel for it. This room is all I can remember, the furniture flimsy and cheap. You win, you escape, you run down the hall as my chin hits my chest and I sleep. Uh, what we got earlier on in here. The cubs and the lions are snoring, wrapped in a big snuggly heap. You're incredibly cute and super duper smart, but why is it so hard to just sleep? So yeah, it's just a little kid's book. I thought it was quite cute. 3.75 out of 5. There we go. All right, I've got two more books to talk to you about. The first one of those is Milk by Emma Rosen. This is non-fiction. Uh, the subtitle is A Story of Breastfeeding in a Society That's Forgotten How. And yeah, this is basically a cross between a memoir and a how-to and a history of breastfeeding, really. And actually, I think a lot of the science behind it was the stuff that I enjoyed the most and like the research that's been carried out, um, you know, the, as, as we say, the history of breastfeeding in, in culture. Like, for example, wet nursing, which I think she described as one of the world's oldest professions. And there was even a point at which wet nurses would pay for their own babies to be wet nursed so that they could go and wet nurse for rich people and earn more money. It's madness. Um, yeah, it was interesting. So again, I had this mixture between this sort of the practical element of the breastfeeding, uh, then with the, the personal memoirs and, um, you know, Emma talking about, it's quite sweet actually to see how her and her husband met and talking about the three children that they have together. And uh, yeah, it was just really interesting. I, I mean, I think, I thought going into this that it was going to have quite limited appeal, but actually, I don't think that's true. I think if you're, you know, if you're a husband and your wife is pregnant or something, this would be a great book to read. Um, also, if you are a new mother, but equally, like, just in general, it was it was an interesting memoir, you know. So I gave it a three point seven five out of five, and I've also done a full review of it for Tarden Danes Indie Read Along. So I will link to that down there below. Okay, and then we have Framed by Ronnie O'Sullivan. So I'm not entirely sure if he actually wrote this himself or if it's ghostwritten. To begin with, I thought maybe he had written it himself because I didn't think it was very good. And then I got hooked on it a little bit. It's um, a fairly generic, like, contemporary crime story, really. This guy who owns a snooker club, his brother wakes up with no memory of the night before. He's covered in blood and uh, basically is arrested for murder. And then Frankie, who's our main character, he then tries to investigate on his own, gets involved in, like, the underworld of Soho and... Uh, yeah, I mean, he it's cool because he's like he owns the snooker club as well, so his like weapon of choice is his snooker cue. So if somebody you know busts into the place, he'll he'll bust out his snooker cue and start beating them up with it. I think uh, this is actually the first of three books in a series as well. So when I first started reading it, I mean, I'm a big Ronnie O'Sullivan fan in terms of him as a snooker player. So when I found out this book was out, I was like, I'm going to read it for the lols. And I started reading it as my bedtime book, and I was like, eh, it's it's all right. And then I switched it over to my main book because I got kind of hooked on it. I mean, it wasn't amazing. There were a few errors in there, here and there as well. But overall, I gave it like a 3.25, maybe a 3.5 out of 5 if I'm feeling super generous. And I probably will read the next one in the series because Ronnie O'Sullivan's the best. Okay, I have two books to update you on. The first one is Fay Diver by Anouk Ricard. Uh, this is a French cartoon book. I'm trying to learn French. Uh, which is why I picked this one up. I'm going to have a go at reading out my review of it to you in uh, in French. Yeah, I mean, the idea being that reading French is going to help a lot. And it's quite funny, like, so here we have, like, so, sort of like, three workers um, on a pylon. So, three workers on an EDF pylon um, being shot at, basically. And these are all based on um, real news headlines as well. So, obviously... She's kind of taken a creative, you know, creative liberties with it, but she's taken a re real headlines and it reinterpreted them herself. So, all right, let's gonna try try and do this. I don't even know if I can speak because I've got a sore throat. But okay, um, j'apprends le français alors, j'apprends le français alors c'était mon premier livre en français. Je ne comprenais pas tout, mais j'ai au délai pour de lire d'une belle française. J'ai ri quelques fois et je trouve ça cool que les dessins soient basés sur des histoires varies. That, did that sound? Did anyone speak French? Somebody tell me how my pronunciation was. 
bad, I imagine. But yeah, it was good. It was a 3.75 out of 5. And then here we have Michael Smith, The Secrets of Station X, How Bletchley Park Helped Win the War. This is non-fiction, all about code breakers at Bletchley Park, uh, working on the Enigma machines. And uh, yeah, it was really fascinating. What I particularly liked is that he, the author, Michael Smith, has really done his research and got some like first-hand accounts from people. So like people who were actually there at the time, he's kind of, you know, got their old letters and memoirs and all this kind of stuff. And um, so, yeah, you really got a feel for kind of some of these super eccentric characters who were living in, in Bletchley Park at the time. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, definitely check it out. I gave it a pretty solid 3.75, maybe even a 4 out of 5. And uh, yeah, my mum actually got me this book because we're hopefully both going to go and visit Bletchley Park soon. So uh, very exciting. Yeah. OK, I've got three more books to talk to you about today. So the first is this just this little one. This is Discovering the Tower of London by Peter Hammond. This is just a little ladybird book. I saw this in um, the charity like uh, book exchange at my local supermarket. And basically, I kind of collect these. I just think they're cute, all the different ladybird books. So every time I see them available, I tend to pick one up. I don't go mental because like sometimes in charity shops, you'll see 30 of them and I'll just buy one, you know. But yeah, this is non-fiction, all about the Tower of London. It covers a lot of the history. Had some really interesting stuff about how the development of gunpowder affected it as well. Uh, some stuff on like the different people who lived there and who died there. There's a great bit about Henry VIII, his uh, armour. They had to keep making him new suits of armour that were bigger and bigger because he kept getting fatter and fatter. All in all, I mean, it's designed for kids, but I enjoyed it as an adult. It's a 3.5 out of 5. Next up we have a bedtime book and this is To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. So me and Virginia Woolf have a bit of a, a history really. So I read Mrs. Dalloway back at university. We were doing a module on London in literature and we had a different book each week. And this was the only book throughout the entire you know semester that I didn't get to the end of. I actually, this is the only book I've ever finished on audiobook. Sorry, Mrs. Dalloway. Mrs. Dalloway is the only book that I ever finished on audiobook before finishing reading it. Um, you know, in the actual physical book form. I did subsequently finish reading the book as well, and I, I since reread it by, by audio earlier this year, actually, and I kind of enjoyed it. So that's why I picked this one up, and it's much in a similar vein. It's very much like a character study, a study of like the social mores at the time. Um, I guess it's feminist in a way. It's also very experimental. There's some great use of metaphors in here, and particularly this idea of, you know, going to the lighthouse. But nothing really happens at the same time. So if you want like an action-packed book, it's definitely not for you. For me, I do tend to prefer action a little bit more. I actually gave this a 3.25 out of 5. I think it was beautifully written and she set out to do something and achieved it. But I couldn't give it anything more than that because of the amount of enjoyment I had. I think I'm going to give you the blurb for this one as well because this just gives you more context about what it's about. I couldn't really explain to you what it's about, you know. One of the greatest literary achievements of the 20th century, To the Lighthouse is Virginia Woolf's most popular novel. This definitive edition, introduced by Quentin Bell, contains the original Hogarth press text as overseen by the author, and a list of the textual variants that appeared during her lifetime. The serene and maternal Mrs. Ramsay, the tragic yet absurd Mr. Ramsay, together with their children and assorted guests, are holidaying on the Isle of Skye. From the seemingly trivial postponement of a visit to a nearby lighthouse, Virginia Woolf constructs a remarkable and moving examination of the complex tensions and allegiances of family life and the conflict between male and female principles. So yeah, there we go. And then finally, I've just finished reading The Comedians by Graham Greene. This is set in Haiti during, I think, like the 1960s during uh, Papa Doc's regime. Basically, it follows these three men. It's like a dark comedy. To be honest, I don't think it's aged particularly well, but it does provide like a really interesting insight into what Haiti was like at the time. I think the book was actually banned there because of the way it like portrayed the people. I mean, it does have stuff like voodoo ceremonies and all this stuff going on. There was a uh, Haitian French Creole in there as well as a language, which I thought was cool. And lots of like little French phrases, which like I'm learning French at the moment. So that was pretty cool to pick up on all of those. But it wasn't green at its best. Uh, it's an all right kind of character study. And there were some pretty good lines and like a lot of uh, I don't know what you'd call them like little quotes that you can take away from it and stuff But considering like a lot happens in this book, but you don't actually see it happen It all happens kind of behind the scenes and then you just sort of see people's reactions to it So yeah overall it wasn't his best. It was like a 3.25 out of 5 for me Maybe a 3.5 out of 5 on a good day But I am at least glad that I've read it because I'm slowly but surely working my way through everything he ever wrote Hi guys, just the one book to talk about today, and that is The Martian Way by Isaac Asimov. This is four short stories. So we have The Martian Way, which basically involves like a colony on Mars and planet Earth 
kind of cuts off the water supply to them, so they have to look elsewhere for a source of water. And then there's a bit of an ironic twist towards the end, which is very cool as well. Uh, so I enjoyed that one quite a bit. And we have youth, two kids on an alien planet keep two lost Earth astronauts as pets. I thought it was a cool concept, but I don't think it quite delivered as much as I was mainly hoping for. The Deep, Roy scouting for an extraterrestrial race, is disgusted by what he learns of Earth biology. So for example, he finds out that children used to be raised by their birth mothers. Oh my goodness. And then finally we have Sucker Bait, which is another good one. The lethal force of a killer planet baffles a crew of top scientists until the despised kid from the mnemonic service remembers an old 20th century report. Basically the idea behind the, the mnemonic service is that in this future, everyone is a specialist, you know? And the job of the people from the mnemonic service is to be more of a generalist and to just absorb as much information as possible and to synthesize new holes to it. So, um, for example, computers have access to all this information, but they don't necessarily have that imagina imagination or that spark of uh, creativity that, I guess, marks the human brain apart. Some really cool ideas in it. He also talked about global warming, basically. Well, he talked about the hothouse effect, which is the greenhouse effect. But this was written in 1955, so that's kind of alarming that he was writing about the hot house effect back then, and we, we still haven't, you know. But yeah, uh, overall pretty good, 3.5 out of 5. It's not Asimov's best, and as with any short story collection, some of them are better than others. But yeah, worth reading. Cool. All right, my actual camera is back, so normal service has been resumed. I have, I think, two more books to update you on. So the first one of those is Ishmael and His Sisters by Louise Stern. This is a book that I was sent as part of like a book subscription box. I'll read you the blurb actually. Um, first before I'm, you know, I'll link to some more information about that below. Basically it was um, all about celebrating different diverse niches that are underrepresented. So in this one it was for the deaf community. So siblings Ishmael, Rosie and Christina are deaf, as are many in their Maya village. The deaf and hearing alike communicate in sign language, forming a tightly knit community with a simple lifestyle. But when Ishmael gets into a fight at the local fiesta and flees the village, leaving Rosie and Christina to fend for themselves, the daily rhythms of village life are disrupted and all that they trust in comes under threat. So this doesn't really have the best reviews on like Goodreads and stuff, but I thought it was okay. I gave it like a 3.25, maybe 3.5 out of 5. It was quite interesting the way that it approached deafness and you know the way that the characters communicate with each other. And all in all, yeah, it was alright. I was glad that they sent me this one. The other one that they included was more of a romance, so I haven't really, you know, gone into that one. But yeah, this one was I yeah. And then I read Down Under by Bill Bryson. I actually read this edition of Down Under by Bill Bryson. And then I got halfway through it and then lost it and then it turned up inside my sofa. But by that point I'd already ordered a replacement edition. So now I'm gonna keep the hardback and uh, you know find a new home for the paperback but yeah this was pretty good it's all about his travels throughout Australia he's clearly done like a lot of research so he covers a lot of the history of the different parts of Australia as well which I thought was really cool a lot of again the Australian culture too it's a fairly recent book I mean I think it was around the turn of the century 2000 maybe and um yeah just worth the read so the last book of his that I read I wasn't such a fan of because I felt like he'd he'd gone traveling through Europe and he just complained about everywhere and it just didn't make me want to travel, which I kind of feel is like the point of a travel book. But um, yeah, in this one, he was kind of back on form and it was it was a pleasure to read it. So yeah, four out of five for this one. And that, my friends, brings me to the end of the month. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.